Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Tuesdays to hop on this webinar tonight. We have about one minute until seven, so I just wanted to talk real quickly about a fundraiser that is currently going on for Special Olympics Maryland. It's called Brackets for Good, and it is in regards to March Madness. It is a bracket-style fundraising tournament where we actually compete against other nonprofit organizations in Maryland. We are trying to out-fundraise them, and it works just like March Madness. If in our first round we beat the nonprofit we're competing against, we move on to the next round and go up against a different nonprofit. So it's a pretty cool thing, and it's really in tune with the whole basketball theme of the month. Also, if we win this and we become the champion, we will receive a $10,000 prize, which is also a huge incentive for us always. So it started on Friday, March 2nd, and you can use this link, or I can also send it out in the email that I will be sending out tomorrow with the slides and everything about the webinar if you're interested. So I have seven on the dot, so let's get started. Thank you all for joining tonight for the Vachi preseason webinar. My name is Kendall Zeslitz, and I am the Special Olympics Maryland Bocce staff liaison. Just so you know, we are recording this webinar, and I will be sending out a link to the recording if you have a coach who is unable to attend along with the slides. Also, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to just raise your hand in the little toolbox, and Mike will let me know that. Also, you can type in the question box if anything pops up. All right, just an important reminder. So no athlete or volunteer can participate in any manner in Special Olympics without having a valid and current medical form or volunteer application. There are absolutely no exceptions to this policy. It's a huge liability to us. So we just have to make sure that everyone has the proper paperwork filled out. I know a lot of coaches have submitted volunteer applications, which thank you for submitting that in advance of the season. We are working on processing them. So we should change your status of your application soon. Okay, and uh, Kendall, actually, if you can go back to that. So this is the, this is Mike, folks. I think I know most of you, Mike Sarnowski, Vice President of the Program uh, for Special Olympics Maryland. Um, really want to not, I don't want to, um, you know, uh, go overboard on this, but need to really drill home the importance of this. Um, it's come to our attention that it is possible that some coaches or, and some counties or areas may actually not be adhering to this and allowing athletes to participate without uh, a medical um, on the, you know, the promise that they're going to bring it next time or a volunteer to do so to participate without uh, a volunteer application form. Um, and as Kendall indicated, that is just, there, there is, that is unacceptable. There is, there is no valid reason that I can think of, uh, that any of us can think of where that would be an acceptable thing to do. Um, you're opening not just yourself, but the entire Special Olympics organization up to um, uh, to a huge liability. And for the athlete, potentially, particularly if they're a new athlete uh, who uh, you haven't seen the form, um, you know, you could be opening them up to some health risks and such. Um, many of you know who know me know I also still coach as a volunteer, different sport, but still coach. Uh, and have to enforce this uh, myself. Um, I would say at least once every season, uh, sometimes twice, we have to tell us a, an athlete that I'm sorry, you can't participate tonight. You can sit over here and watch. Um, and uh, you know we have to have that form uh, in there. Uh, we're not trying to be bureaucratic. We're not trying to be officious here. This is an absolutely essential component. It's something that's required nationwide uh, it's not something unique to Maryland. Um, and if you walk away from tonight's webinar with nothing else, walk away knowing that this is an absolute no exception requirement. Um, as Kendall will note on an upcoming uh, slide, I think it's two slides up, with, which has all the deadlines and such on it. There is a deadline that we call the missing forms or the missing uh, paperwork, or whatever deadline. Do not misconstrue that to mean that you can have an athlete participating without their forms up until that date. That is strictly an administrative deadline. Um, it gives areas some time if they, for whatever reason, haven't gotten a form into us. Um, uh, for whatever reason, people are human, I understand that. Um, um, but that gives them a few days after being notified 
to get that form in. But that's with the understanding that they already that that form is already in hand. Um, so it, uh, again, don't let that confuse you or make anybody think that that means it's acceptable for someone to be participating without their medical form or in the case of a volunteer without their volunteer application. We will be adhering to that deadline strictly. We've given some leeway and such in the past, and it's, uh, it, uh, it gives us a, uh, um, just patterns over the last year or so have given us concern that maybe people are uh, uh, looking at our flexibility from the standpoint of it, that it's not, uh, that the rule doesn't apply. It absolutely does, and um, um, I'll leave it at that. So that said, thank you, everybody, for everything you're going to do this season and working with your athletes and such. Um, and want to go on a much more positive tone the rest of the time here, but uh, uh, an important message that we needed to, to share with folks. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and mute again, Kendall. Thank you, Mike. So just to reiterate what Mike said, please work with your area leadership to make sure that we have all of these forms submitted. It really is for the health and safety of all of our athletes and everyone involved with the program. As for dates for summer games, our training registration deadline is going to be on April 26th. This is when you need everyone who is going to be participating in bocce at summer games in GMS. So work with whoever is in charge of your GMS program in your county and make sure that they have your accurate roster and that everybody is in there. The last date for your missing forms to be submitted is going to be May 7th, and these forms need to be good throughout summer games. So that date is going to be June 10th. So that is when, if it's June 11th, it expires, that's totally okay, but June 10th, it needs to be good through. The competition registration deadline is May 24th. This is when everyone needs to be entered into their events in GMS. So have everyone who's on their doubles team lined up with the right people and have their scores entered. And then the last date is not applicable to us because it's just for athletics and swimming. For bocce, in order to qualify for the state championships held at summer games, you need to attend two qualifiers. If you compete in a qualifier, this can qualify you for whatever bocce event at state. So if you have an athlete who goes to two qualifiers and they just participate in singles, they can still compete in doubles or as part of a team at the actual state competition. And if you have an athlete who has a special need or a circumstance, please let your area's GMS manager know so they can put that into GMS because that is what we see on our end so we can properly prepare for the competition to give the athletes the best experience possible. The events that we are gonna be offering this year are the same as we've had in the past. We will do singles. And within singles, we have full court and half court. We have doubles and unified doubles and team and unified team. And a team is made up of four different individuals. Athletes are able to enter into two events at summer games. They can do singles and doubles or they could do singles and a four-person team unfortunately they can't do doubles or a four-person team so it has to be the singles in one of them also partners can only be in one event so they can either do doubles or they could do the four-person team these are the qualifiers that we currently have scheduled as you can see it looks a little bit there but thank you to everyone who has worked to schedule them so far if you are interested in hosting a qualifier or you know that you will have bocce at your county spring games, please let me know or let your regional sports director know and send us a sanction form so we can spread the word and get you guys as many competition opportunities as possible. This year we are having our USA games out in Seattle. And we have four athletes along with a coach who is going to be in the bocce competition representing Team Maryland. So we are asking that all athletes going to Seattle play in their double pairs for USA games, regardless of their delegation. I know all athletes are from different delegations, but in order to compete at USA games, they do have to be playing together at state. So the counties affected by this are Frederick, Anne Arundel, Howard, and Montgomery. If you are a coach for this county and you have a question about how this works, please feel free to email me or give me a call and I can explain it to you or I can direct you to someone who might explain it a little bit better. Coaching requirements for bocce are the same as they are with all other Special Olympic sports. 
We require that the coach has the Class A volunteer application along with the background screening that comes with that process of doing the application. They need to do the protective behavior screening and the online concussion training and the coach sport, coach sport certification. Quite a tongue twister. All of the above are valid for three years. And for the coach sport certification, I did send out a spreadsheet that shows all of the coaches and their certification status. If you were not on that list, please contact me and I can add you to it and I can let you know where you stand. But I also sent out earlier today and yesterday about our coaches trainings that we have coming up. There will be an in-person one in Baltimore at Faring Bay Brook Recreation Center. And that is gonna be next Tuesday. And we will also be doing an online portion, which is gonna be Monday the 26th. I will resend out the links for both of them in case you didn't see that. That way you can register for them but please make sure your coaches that need to complete the certification are going to attend one or the other. And again, with the concussion certification, this is good for three years and you have two options of doing it, the CDC Heads Up Concussion Course or the NFS, NFHC Concussion and Sports Course. I have always done the Heads Up Concussion. Just, it takes about 25 minutes, 30 minutes tops. It's super easy to do. And once you finish it, if you could email a PDF certificate to coaches at somd.org, that way we know that you completed it and we can add it to your record in GMS. Protective behaviors, this is also something you need to complete. The link for it is in these slides, which I will send out tomorrow so you have it. For you submit this to Kadisha, our registration coordinator, and her email is listed here. We also do receive a list of all of the people who complete this. But just to be sure that we get it, if you could send it to either me or to Kadisha, that would be great. So we can make sure we have everything in check for you. The coach's code of conduct is something that we always try to have at all of our events and throughout the season that coaches are just aware of. I'm not going to read through every bullet point because I'm sure most of you are very well aware of it. And I don't want to take up too much of your time. But just some of the sections are having respect for others, ensuring a positive experience, acting professionally and taking responsibility for action, quality service to the athletes, and the health and safety of the athletes. The whole reason that we are all here is for our athletes, to give them a good experience, something they might not have had before. So we really try to have all of our coaches stay true to this code of conduct, and it just turns out to be a greater event for everyone. So with that being said, one of our big roles is coaching athletes during competition. We run into this time and time again, so it's really a big thing. Please make sure you are not actually coaching your athletes during the competition. Only athletes that are competing, partners, and designated volunteers and officials are allowed on the court. That means coaches aren't allowed on the court. Parents and spectators aren't allowed on the court. Once the clock starts, there is allowed to be no coaching or instructional assistance. And this applies to both coaches, spectators, parents, really anyone who's not involved in actually playing the game. Teammates are allowed to talk with one another prior to stepping onto the court. But we ask that once the game is in play, that you kind of just let your athlete do what they're going to do. They know how to play the sport. So it's kind of their time to shine. So this next section I'm going to skip through pretty quickly because I'm sure you've all seen all these slides over and over again. Athletes all have to have a valid and current medical. So these slides just kind of show what the medical is. If you have athletes who are in need of a medical and you don't know where to access it, please just email me and I can send you a link for it. Along with that, we have the volunteer application, which once you fill this out, that's how we conduct our background checks and it's good for three years. So it's just a simple form. And it takes only a few minutes, but it's something that we have to have for all volunteers, unified partners, coaches, et cetera. All right. Sorry, there are so many forms in here. Like I said, with the coaches sport certification, this is valid for three years. All coaches need to have it valid through the date of the actual summer game. And if I come up with any other coaches training ideas, I will definitely send them your way. If you are a coach who has been coaching for a while and you're very confident in your ability to teach bocce and you're interested in hosting uh, coaches training, please reach out to me. I would love to schedule that. 
All right. These are some of the online trainings that you can do via ASAP. We have the coaching Special Olympics athletes that we require of all of our coaches to do. This is going to eventually be free. Initially, you have to pay, but you just submit your receipt. You can send that to me, and I will make sure that you get reimbursed for it. So just a few additional resources before I get into the nitty grittiness of the rules. I have the actual link to the rules from the Olympics International site, as well as the rule changes from 2016. We release rule changes once every two years, and the 2018 ones have not come out yet, so we will be adhering to the ones that were released in 2016. There's also a video that shows good practices for coaching bocce and the bocce coaches resource guide, which has a ton of pages, but it's really a great thing if you are unsure how to start your bocce program or you just kind of want to refresh on how to have a great season, this is a very good resource to do so. And if you have any questions at the end of this that I did not answer, please feel free to either give me an email or call me. My cell phone number is right there. Or you can contact your regional sports director. And if you are unsure of who that is, we have them all listed out. And they will connect you with me and we'll find you the answer that you're looking for. All right, into the rules. So we're just going to go through the rules. We've highlighted a few. Um, it's similar to what was done last year just the big ones and then at the end we have a few special Olympics modifications that we really want to emphasize. So the events available are singles that we do full court and half court which is 30 feet, doubles, the team competition which is four players per team, unified doubles and unified team and we also are allowing a singles ramp so one player per team is using a ramp that can be for the singles or it could be for doubles. The court itself is 12 feet by 16 feet, unless you are using a half court, which is 12 feet by 30 feet. In the Bashi, we use eight balls, and we have a smaller target object, which is called the Polina. For divisioning, I will touch on this towards the end of the slides. We have some layouts that make it a lot easier to understand. Um, but this is just kind of how you are going to get your player's assessment, which will be submitted to us, and that's how we division for the state competition. We will be doing a coin toss to determine which team has the Polina and the choice of ball color. If there is not an official available, the two team captains will do the coin toss, although we don't envision this happening because, luckily enough, we always have a ton of awesome officials that come out to summer games. The three attempts rule, which doesn't happen too frequently, but we just need everyone to be aware of it. So if someone, if a team is throwing the Polina three times and it doesn't land where it's supposed to, the opposing team gets to throw the Polina once. However, if they miss two, then the Polina is going to be put where the 40 feet from where they throw. This is a change from last year, but because it's in the rules, we are really going to adhere to it this year. And the sequence of play, so it doesn't matter. If you have a team of four people, it can be athlete, athlete, partner, partner for the first time you go around, as long as everyone throws. The next game, it could go athlete, partner, athlete, partner, and so on, just as long as everyone's throwing an equal amount of time and you're not skipping the other team. That is totally fine. For ball delivery, you have the option of rolling, tossing, bouncing, and baking the ball, as long as it is an underhand release. So we don't want someone just overhand chucking the ball down the bocce court because, one, it wouldn't go where it's supposed to go probably, but also it can be dangerous. So the number of balls played by each player, one player is able to play four balls, a two-player team, each player gets to play two, and a four-player team, each player is allowed to play one ball. I've already touched on coaching, so I don't think we need to talk about it anymore, but I know this has been an issue in the past, so if you have any questions about it, please just me and I can kind of go over some points for that. With scoring, if you have a four-player team, which means one ball per person, you go for 16 points. That is how you win the game. For both a two-player team and a one-player team, you go for 12 points. And we do, with scoring, we have a special fix Maryland adjustment to that, which will come up in the supplement that I have after these slides. 
unified sports teams. We have been growing our unified program, which is absolutely great. So a unified doubles team would have one athlete and one partner, and a unified four-person team would have two athletes and two partners. Like I said earlier, there's really no requirement for what order they have to throw in, just as long as everyone throws an equal amount of time. All right, fouls. So one of the biggest ones that we see is the foul line foul. If an athlete crosses over that foul line while they are throwing, then that ball would be considered dead. Another foul that we see is moving the ball or the polina. Um, having a player throw more than his allotted number of balls with respect to the two or four player team. We understand sometimes athletes get carried away and they don't realize how many balls that they throw. However, this would make the ball be considered dead and they would not be able to count that for any point. Another big foul would be the illegal movement of a ball belonging to your own team, as well as the illegal movement of a ball of your opponent's team. Once the ball is on the court, you cannot walk up to it and just move it out of the way. Same with the Polina. You really can't just go up there and readjust it based off of where you want it. All right, so now we are going to get into the supplements, which these have some images, so it makes it a little bit easier to see. I know I'm a visual person, so this always helps me. With the events, like we discussed, we have singles for the full court, which is 60 feet, and the half court, which is 30 feet. And then we offer traditional doubles and unified doubles and traditional four-person teams and unified four-person teams. Athletes can enter into two events, singles and or doubles, or a four-person team. And unified partners may enter in one event, doubles or a four-person team. We do offer a ramp for the athletes who are in need of one, which I will touch on in the next slide. For the half court, which is the 30-foot court, um, we only allow singles in this, and it's intended for athletes with a lower ability. So typically an athlete whose assessment is a score of 700 or higher, and this is only a singles event. So please do not try to register your teams in doubles for half court because we do not offer that. So as you can see in this photo, there is no center line in half court. So the Polina can really end up anywhere. Your athlete is going to throw right where it says next to the out of play. You can kind of see the bocce player. And athletes always throw from one direction in half court bocce. If the three attempt rule has to be employed in half court, the Polina will be placed 40 feet from the throwing line in the center of the court. The half court game will be played according to all the other special Olympics Maryland rules. It's just played on the half side. So pretty much everything is the same with that besides the length of the court and not having a center line. For equipment, we use green and red bocce balls, same as last year, and the Polina will be either yellow or white. One big note for equipment is that we do allow weight we do allow ramps. We also allow use of lighter weight balls. Um, we're going to be using that for this season and for summer games. However, we are asking coaches to, coaches to encourage to strongly consider the use of a ramp instead of the lightweight balls. The lighter weight balls are a competitive disadvantage because of the density of the regulation balls. And we only allow those to use lightweight balls if it's an athlete who has historically used balls in this competition, which is two athletes and in justifiable cases of extreme need. So if you have a new athlete who's joining your team who really needs to use a lightweight ball, you have to require clearance from your area director and please let me know as well so we can plan accordingly and make sure that this athlete really does need to use a lightweight ball. Athletes who are using ramps and lightweight balls aren't going to be divisioned exclusively. They are just division based off of their divisioning score. So they aren't all going to be in one division by themselves. They will be spread out based off of what you give them in their assessment. For divisioning, a qualifying score has to be reported for each player, and that includes your unified partner. And this is found by doing the player's assessment for divisioning. I'm sure you all have your own methods of doing the assessment, but I will be creating kind of a generic form just to make it easier in case you don't have a clear way to do that right now. Make sure that you inform your area's GMS manager once you get your player assessments completed so they can enter that into GMS. 
because that is the basis of what I division for for the state competition. For double uh, team, Kendall, to... if you oh, could sorry. pause for just a moment. Um, Mike yep. Janice has a question, but Mike, I'm sending you your PIN number. I can't open up your phone line until you type in your PIN. Uh, if that doesn't work, you can try typing your question in. So as soon as uh, we can do that, we'll ask that. But Kendall, why don't you go ahead? Okay, perfect. For um, doubles and team registration, one qualifying score is unique to that individual, so it's not a combined score. GMS actually calculates the scores for us, so you just put in what everyone receives in the assessment and say Mary and Tom are on a double team together. You would take Mary's score and enter hers into GMS and then Tom's score and enter that in and GMS will do math and it will generate their team score as the total of the two. So please make sure that you are doing their individual scores when you are having your GMS manager enter them in. Okay. Along. I'm sorry, and we do have a question. I'm sorry, uh, go ahead and finish that thought and then we'll go to the other question we have. Okay, with um, winning, we discussed the points <coughs> earlier, 16 points for a four person team and 12 for a doubles pair or for singles. However, the winners determine once they either reach that number of points or if the time limit expires, whichever occurs first. So if the time expires and one team is at 10 and the other team is at eight, the team that is at 10 points is going to win that game. I can take a question now. Okay, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Mike's still muted, but uh, Rennie, uh, looks like you have a question. Your line should be open. I had myself on mute too. Yeah, uh, no, um, to go back to the prior page for the assessment score. Um, it, for their qualifying score, there is a very specific rule-bound way of doing the assessment score. And everybody has to follow it in order to get there, to get to turn in the score. And so for everybody to remember, you've got to have the athletes throw a minimum of three balls at the 30-foot line, the 40-foot line, and the 50-foot line. And then the distance from those three balls at each of those distances has to be added up, the distance between the ball and the polina. So you've got nine scores that you have to add up, and that's what makes the qualifying score. And you cannot deviate from that process. Now, there are certain things that you can do beyond that to give you more additional information, but you must adhere to that rule. Um, and it was, it used to be in a prior year in one of the slides. Um, and I, that's why I just want to make sure that you can't go create your own assessment. Um, you must follow that rule. Rennie, you are one step ahead of me. That was actually my next slide. I have diagrams too to explain how to do it. But, but, Do we have any other you. questions? Uh, at this point, that looks like that's it. All right. So with forfeiture, this is another modification that we make um, for Special Olympics because we understand on a doubles team or a four-person team, sometimes someone will run off and get lost in the chaos that is summer games, and we don't want to completely hold that team accountable for that. So if this occurs, then an alternate cannot be activated. The team or double squad can compete with the existing players minus the balls of the absent player. So if it's a doubles team and the athlete goes missing, the partner can still compete. However, they will only be able to throw their two balls compared to the four balls that they would initially be able to throw if their complete team was there. Another modification that we make with timeouts is that we will not be affording timeouts unless there is an injury or an illness. We have a ton of athletes and a ton of competition to get through, so we like to keep things moving. So we will not be doing them unless it's an emergency. And if this happens on your court, please get the attention of whatever volunteer is around you or the official, and they will let us all know, and we'll make sure that we call the proper timeout. For attire, we ask that you wear long pants or shorts, either golf or tennis shorts or Bermuda shorts, just not jeans, running shorts, or short shorts. 
Also, please wear athletic shoes that don't damage or harm the playing surface. You are able to wear hats, but we do not allow hats that have any sponsorship or corporate logos on them. And a collared shirt is required for competition. If your athletes are not following this uniform, then they risk the chance of being disqualified. So now into our divisioning, which thank you again, Rennie. Um, we have this, it's kind of perfectly laid out. So you can see it as a step-by-step -step thing and really use this as a resource for when you're doing your assessment. Your player is going to roll all eight bocce balls at once. They aim for three different spots. So they're rolling a total of eight balls three times. So I think my math is correct, so that's 24, but it's been a long day. Don't hold me accountable for that. Um, the first one, they're aiming for spot one, which is going to be the 30-foot line. The player rolls all eight bocce balls, and the coach will measure the three balls that are closest to the plena. It's very important that you measure this in inches. That way, everything is the same and none of the qualifying scores get skewed. You're going to do the same thing for spot number two, which is on the 40-foot line. So you roll all eight balls and you count the ones that are the three closest. And the same for spot number three on the 50-foot line. So this is how you get all nine of your scores that you then total. And that is how you discover your assessment score for the athlete. Okay. Uh, we have a question from George Hale. Sure. George, your line should be open. Hi, uh, this is uh, just a clarification. Those measurements should be made in inches. Yeah, please. Thank you, George. Any other questions on the procedure for assessment? Uh, actually, someone's typed one in. Uh, let's see, this is going back to game time. Uh, last summer, the, this is from uh, Coach uh, Mike Saltzman. Uh, last summer, the game time was reduced. Will we go back to the longer time so that the athletes can be, that are slower uh, will not be penalized? That is something that I will discuss with the sports management team and the games management team, but I will follow up on that once I have more information. Yeah, I think it has to do, uh, Mike, with, um, uh, the capacity and the number of, of coaches or number of athletes or competitors, the intent is certainly uh, whenever possible to have that full game time. So, uh, but we'll get back with you on that. Just another tip for when you are doing your assessments, if you have courts that you are able to take apart, one way that you can help get as many athletes going through their assessment as possible is you can split them up into a horseshoe style and you just have to mark the appropriate foot spot line, which is 30 feet away from spot number one. So like I said, with the assessments, I will be sending out a form that will make recording it easier for you, but you do not have to use it at all. It's just kind of something for you to use at your convenience. And that is all of the information that I have right now. As more qualifiers are posted, I will make sure to get that information to you. And same goes with any additional coaches trainings that we offer. Does anyone have any questions at the moment? I just want to share one last thing with you. Let's see. All right, so we are going to be doing a unified bocce event with Exelon. I know some of you participated in this last year, and we would love to get as many athletes out as possible. It's going to be on April 10th from 4.30 until tentatively 6.30 at the Sandlot in Baltimore. They are having a town hall meeting with all of their employees, and they would like to play unified bocce with about 40 of our athletes. There will be parking on site that's compensated. And we will have more details as we get closer to the actual date of the event. Dinner will be provided and Bashi participants are going to receive a commemorative t-shirt. And the big incentive to do this is the county program with the most participants signed up will receive a prize. We don't know exactly what that prize is yet, but it's probably going to be great. So please, if you are interested, I'm going to send out a link tomorrow to sign up. Try to get as many of your athletes who are able to make it out as possible. 
it's going to be a great day and it'll also kind of just give them another opportunity to practice their bocce skills in order for summer games. Anyone have uh, any questions on X1? Um, the, uh, uh, Rennie has indicated that uh, Montgomery County will be hosting a qualifier on May 19th. So we'll add that to the schedule. Um, but uh, May 19th uh, is an additional qualifier. And looking, Wonderful. I don't. Yeah, I don't see any other raised hand. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not correct. Annette Hartz. Annette, your line should be open. You should be able to speak to us. Okay, I should also say, uh, Annette, congratulations on joining Team Maryland. Annette's come on board on Team Maryland as a, uh, a bocce coach to help lead our team out to Seattle. So thank you much. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Um, I do want to say that we are having a local qualifier on April 20th and it's our spring games and we're looking also to do a qualifier maybe later on, on one of our practices on a Thursday night. We haven't met with my team yet, but we're going to work that out too to have another local qualifier. Awesome. Thank you, Annette. Yeah, if anyone, if you guys come up with any other qualifiers that your county wants to hold, even if they are just for your county, it's an in-house qualifier, please just let me know and I can make sure that we put it on our calendar. Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? I don't see any others. So. Well. Thank you, everyone, for joining me tonight. I hope I got you out of here a little quicker than expected. I will be sending out, like I said, a few links tomorrow along with the recording and the slide for this. So have a great night, and I'm looking forward to getting your boxing season started. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great season.